if we're going to be faithful as Christians who live in America, we have to engage with what's happening at the broader world, not just what happens in our homes. I'll say it again. If we want to be Christians who are faithful to what we're called to, we live in a particular place at a particular time, we have to press in to what's happening in our world. And like I said, uh, my goal is not a politician. We're not ending this and you're voting for me afterwards. Uh, But I do want to pastor us well through this season and give us some things to consider as we line up our lives under King Jesus. uh, And then we'll dive into the liturgy like we normally do. But I wanted to start uh, where many of us are at instead of just blazing past Uh, some of the anxieties, fears, or even concerns that are on our hearts and our minds that we gather. So would you guys pray with me? Jesus, we are glad that you meet with us, uh, that we don't gather in your name but without your presence, but as real and as tangible as the breath that we feel against our mask, you are here with us. And so we thank you for that. We're grateful that you gather here with us. We're grateful that you allow us to gather together. We're grateful for the health that's allowed us to be in this place. And so uh, we pray over our sisters and brothers who are unable to gather. Would you continue to show yourself powerful in their lives? And would you help us to more faithfully take up our role in your story as we're sent to love God, love neighbors, and love one another? Uh, We love you, and we ask this in your name. Amen. So it was my, my 30th birthday when I learned this lesson. Uh, our family had just amped up. It, it had been Kaylee Ann and I who were part together. Uh, Kaylee Ann and I in a house tucked into this nice little lagoon backed up in the rural uh, part of New Jersey. It was beautiful. And we had just accelerated our family and adopted Kenzie. And then a few days later had welcomed in three foster girls. So it went from like, me and Kaylee Ann, nice, cool, whatever we want to do, to all of a sudden uh, a little bit more chaotic. This particular day, I just returned from a trip from Haiti, where I'd spent a few days with local Christians, learning from them and with them, while resp- responding to some of the uh, immediate aftermath of the 2010 earthquake in Port-au-Prince that was still lingering on at this point. I'd flown back from Haiti on one of those enjoyable overnight flights. I'd enjoyed a wonderful custom experience in Miami. And then I had a massive layover, and then I flew to Newark, which is equally as exciting. I drove the two hours back down to my house, dropped off all the people that had come with me on this trip because I had got commandeered into driving. And then if I was writing the script, I would have gone home, ate something, passed out on my bed, woken up, and had a party that celebrated me and my life because it was my birthday, and I should party like it's my birthday. But I don't get to write the script. Uh, This day I got back, and Kaylee Ann wasn't actually in town. She was visiting her parents in Nebraska with our daughter. And so I got to pick up the three foster girls from my mom's house. And on the way home, they said, hey, can we carve pumpkins? And if you're a parent, uh, you love to actually extend the hours where activities are going on between kids sleeping. Am I right? Like, you're trying to fill that day so that way they then fall asleep and pass out again. So we said, yep, grab the pumpkins, uh, put out the newspaper covering over the table because of all that gunky stuff that comes off the seeds that nobody wants sticking to everything. Uh, And then pulled out the knives and laid them out and gave the speech, be careful, uh, they're sharp, right? And so the kids came and uh, we laid it all out, had the pumpkins, and I started to cut the pumpkins out so that way we could reach in and get the gunk out. Uh, The youngest girl decided that she was going to be a little bit impatient and wanted to cut her own pumpkin. And so grabbed the knife and in like one move started cutting it, blade towards herself, hand on the pumpkin. And some of you are cringing. I can see it in your eyes because that's how the story goes. She took the knife and it went in one swoop straight into her hand. And at that moment, it didn't matter that I was tired. Uh, It didn't matter that I had just gotten off a week of amazing ministry and I felt like I should have a rest. It didn't matter that I was probably uh, the person least likely to handle a medical emergency. It didn't matter that I didn't know how to navigate state state insurance. Uh, What I learned that day was that you don't have a choice when a crisis comes your way, but you have to respond. The blood, the confusion, the pain all demanded that I step in. And while maybe not perfectly, I had to respond in the best way I knew how to address the wound that was in front of me. And so as a pastor, I find myself in that place now. As followers of Jesus in America, we find ourselves in a similar place right now. As fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, friends, neighbors, we find ourselves in that place in Mesa right now. 
And if you find yourself being like, man, I thought this was church. Like, I, I thought we were going to hear a message. We were going to take communion, get some encouraging good news. I pray that all still takes place. But what we do gathered here together, we have to remember that we gather here not just because it's a hobby, but because we're centered in on the gospel of Jesus. And the gospel of Jesus necessarily takes place in a story, right? This big story of God. And God's story, third, has always revolved around a people who were called to be a witness to God in the midst of a culture. And those people always have a missionary encounter with the idols of their culture, and our experience will be no different. Somebody texted me and asked if I was going to speak on what took place on the Wednesday at the Capitol, and I said, absolutely. And their follow-up question was so revealing. They said, aren't you worried that you're going to tick people off? And I thought about it for a second. That honestly wasn't my first flinch, though. I'm pl happy to have plenty of ongoing conversations. But my answer was humble, simple, but honest. That said, the fact that you have to ask that question shows me that we have to talk about it. And here's why. The fact that you think that because I'm a Christian pastor, and when I remind my church what Jesus has called us to, that that's going to tick people off who are a part of that church, and they're going to get angry at me for what Jesus says, shows that there's this division between ideal and reality when it comes to who the people of God are in the world today. Like the fact that you're asking, oh, you're going to really tick off the people of God when you tell them what God has said and remind them what God has invited us into. That it's going to make people mad, not compel them to worship. And I get it. A part of that's true. Uh, there are people who claim the name of Jesus, whose true prophets are political pundits, with news flowing from the stations, not of the risen king and of the Bible, but of whatever their perspective is. And many choose to renew their mind on podcasts, YouTube clips, and news loops, all to find out how to think rather than to turn to the Spirit of the living God and His revealed Word. And I want to say this, and so please make sure that you're still tracking with me if you're still here. So glad to hear it. Um, I don't think what took place is the heart or the desire even of the people who voted Republican on the last ballot. I think sometimes when we talk about these things, they're like, ooh, see that? The church is against Republicans. That is not the case. In fact, most of the people that I've talked to, I have a few friends who were actually there at the rally. I have other friends uh, who would mourn and lament and were actually in tears saying, like, this is the problem. They're going to get the name that we have as Republicans and take that through the mud with this fiasco. And so I'm not speaking to you if you wrote Republican and voted that way on a ballot. That's not my intention at all. But I am speaking, and I want to say this clearly, to those who want to use the name of Jesus to incite and normalize hate, coercion, and violence as the way of the kingdom of God. And invite us to count ourselves with those who won't remain silently complicit on what's happening in the name of Jesus. If you looked at the images and you watched the snapshots, there, there are people being permitted to carefully construct nooses in the capital space. Like, think about that. They felt comfortable bringing six-by-sixes, constructing them up in a public space, and hanging a noose from it. There are those who are saying that six million Jews were not enough in the Holocaust. There are those who are calling for a whiter future for America while waving flags with our Savior's name on it. And brothers and sisters, this can't be ignored. We don't have the luxury of saying, well, that's D.C., or that's not my friend group. Because your neighbors are watching that news station and seeing the same cross that you wear around your neck, the one adorning the true story in your house, the one that holds the books up on the shelf and saying, I wonder if that God is the same God that I see over here. We can't sit in silence while neighbors ask, is that you? Is that your Jesus? The cross looks like the one that you have. Does your, that symbol stand over you like it stands over them? And so I want to, as clearly as I can, state that Christian nationalism, uh, that is the twisted version of Christianity that blends the redemption of Jesus with the religion of America, 
and all of its symbols and rhetoric does not stand for our King Jesus. And they are against what God intended for human flourishing in creation. And so we're not going to silently tolerate it or avoid it or verbally advocate for that here. Uh, We want to be able to answer our neighbors boldly and clearly, that is not the Jesus I worship. And so I'm going to reverse this back and just say three things clearly. I don't hate America. (laughs) I love this country. And because I love this country, I hate the idolatry that destroys it, uh, whether that's from the left or the right. There is so much good that we can be thankful for in this place that we call home. But there are also immense, great amounts of injustice that have been done that have to be dealt with. And there's evil that takes place in the name of an empire that we as Christians should be first to call out. That has always been the way of Jesus. Uh, Second, we're equal opportunity critics of the story that inform our culture. Uh, Today's story and the headlines on Wednesday happen to be those that fall from a far right. But there are plenty of nuances and stories coming from many different means and culture where we also need to carefully critique those in lens of what God says in his word, not just a verse, but the whole sweep of scripture. We must continue to grow as those who love our neighbors and those who live out of the biblical story. Uh, This means that we don't look to technology, to politicians, or personal wealth as our savior, but Jesus and the kingdom that he is bringing. I would push us all to say we should spend far more time in the Sermon on the Mount than we do searching the internet for hot takes on the latest political action. I think the people of God would be far shaped uh, in a much more profound way if the voice that we heard was Jesus himself calling us how to live when we disagree with an empire or a leadership or an authority that's over us. That's Matthew 5 through 7. Spend some time. Uh, The last thing, this is not going away. And so uh, as Jesus' church, we need to realize that this is not an episode of a sitcom. Like we're not going to tune it on next week and everything would have changed. The characters have changed, kind of switched out moms in the show and nobody knew what happened. But whatever, the show goes on and it's a new set of problems. Uh, This culture that we're in right now is going to continue to be a place for us to demonstrate gospel faithfulness or not. And we have to do the hard work over long periods of time of doing what I want to call proximate justice. And so not just giving political takes on the big things that we're never going to come in contact with, but how do we actively love God, love our neighbor, love one another in the spaces that we actually can touch, the places that we actually do walk, the lives that we live with our missional communities alongside them, giving voice to the ways of Jesus and embodying what that looks like. This is our moment to identify our own false allegiances, our own failures, and press into the gospel with a fresh faith, asking what does it look like to trust God in this trying time? So let's go back to the kitchen on my 30th birthday. It was a great birthday, and I hope it was my 30th. It might have been my 29th, but I was going back and forth. Whatever. Um, I carefully wrapped her hand in a towel, right? Um, She had already taken the knife out. I was kind of skeptical on that. I was like, you kind of want to leave that. I don't know if you, whatever. It was out. We put a towel on it, wrapped it around, had her sister throw some pressure on it, and then we left the house looking like a crime scene, uh, hopped in the truck, and decided we were going to go to urgent care because that was closer. Drove to urgent care, then drove around urgent care to find out small town urgent care is not open 24 hours, uh, but instead had to drive to the hospital. There's two hospitals, equal distance apart. One has a really bad reputation, but you get in quicker. One has a worse reputation, or a better reputation, but it takes longer to get into. Uh, So we went to the the one I could get into faster because I was like, I don't know how long this, like, homemade bandage is going to hold, right? So we go, and then we have to wait in the waiting room. And because we'd done such a good job holding it, the uh, front desk ladies didn't believe that it was that big of a deal until we went back, and they're like, let me see. And she's like, shh. They're like, oh, get back there. And so we got to run back, and then we had to wait in the wait in that room, right, for a doctor to come in to do the initial consultation, do the initial stitching. We get sent home, have to gingerly care for that wound. Uh, then we have to go back to get a specialist who's much more uh, competent in the ways of putting tendons back together. So we got to go do that. And then we had months of therapy. 
And then by some consistent care and ongoing prayer, her hand was able to work again, and she was able to use it again. So what's the point of all that besides just making you cringe? Handling the wound immediately allowed us to continue months in the process of healing that was going to be required. The path wasn't straightforward or simple, but over time, with consistent care and persistent prayer, we saw that hand healed. And so even if we respond to this crisis, and when this one's over, there's going to be another one. And and the ways that we respond, it's not going to be a simple response that deals things for long periods of time, but healing is always, always involves complexity. But would we be dedicated to consistent care of our neighbors and thoughtful prayer for our nation as we follow Jesus in 2021? And I I wanted us to start there because I think to start somewhere else would do an injustice to what we even do as we gather. Uh, Yes, we believe in a high and lifted up and mighty Jesus who reigns supreme. And yes, God is absolutely in control no matter what happens on the small little spectrums of human existence. But somehow in that mystery, he's called human beings to steward their part of God's creation well. And that's what we want to do. And I want to invite all of us to continue to press in to who is God, what has God done, who has he made us, what do we now do as the central uh, orienting factors of who we are. Not our first allegiance to a party, not being offended when a party fails us because they always will, Uh, not afraid to critique those that we love the most because we want to continue to grow up in healthy ways as a community. The good news will continually be the message but the methods that we love our neighbors will always be missionary in nature. And so I don't have all the answers, and that isn't pretending in my soapbox to have all the answers. That's me calling us to be faithful to who God's called us to be in loving one another, in loving our neighbor, and loving our God. And would we do the hard work of uncovering what that looks like in our moment so that we can be faithful?